Jeff McMahon here with the Backstage Pass, powered by the sports guys. And uh, welcome to the show, Maggie Ball. Hey. We are glad to have you. I was telling you uh, offline that um, I've been kind of stalking you a little bit. And in the back channel, we crossed paths on Instagram. I did not know that this interview was coming up. I didn't know I was going to have the opportunity to to dig into your world a little bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, really digging the music, really liking what I'm finding. And uh, I appreciate you carving out a little time for us today. How you doing, hon? Absolutely. I'm doing great. I'm currently trying to figure out because what we talked about off stage is that I'm not very technological savvy. I was born in the decade of... <laughs> I'm 21, so I've been born yep. in the decade of technology, but I am not very tech savvy. I feel like I'm I'm so old school. Um, so I'm currently trying to figure out how to share this on my Facebook page. So if you see me yeah. looking around, that's what I'm doing. I promise I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. And um, and we will always be able to to share this to your page afterwards if you want. It will be it will be shared and all that. So. No reason to get bogged down in all that. Now, my understanding is that you are uh, you are now in Nashville, but originally from Florida, right? Yes. So I'm originally from South Florida, born and raised, and I moved to Nashville when I was 18, about three and a half years ago. Okay. And uh, so you came right out of high school. I did. Literally, I had, I remember this, May 20th was my graduation, and that was on a Saturday. I yeah. had a graduation leaving party on Sunday, and I packed my Jeep up, and my dad helped me drive to Nashville on Monday. Now, was that an easy sell to your folks? Honestly, I've been coming to Nashville since I was like 13 years old. I've right. been coming every summer to write with people and record an album, um, and then junior and so, uh, senior year, I was coming to Nashville a lot more, like a couple weeks out of the month. Um, so it, they knew that's what I wanted to do. I would slowly move things because I already had an apartment here, senior right. year. So they knew that this is where I wanted to be. They knew that this is what I needed to do. So it was, it was hard to officially just leave, but they also knew that this was where I need to be if this is what I wanted to do. And you had been sharpening those swords for a long time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now you had um, a lot of stuff I found on the internet. And if it's on the internet, it's got to be true. So you can correct this as we go. But um, my understanding, I mean, obviously you're a singer songwriter now. You're recording a lot of your own material and you've got some new stuff out. But yes. you started out first as a musician. Right. I did. So I started playing violin when I was six years old and I was classically trained. I did the Suzuki method. Um, I went to middle school of the arts for orchestra. And so I actually played Carnegie Hall in like seventh grade. And so Juilliard was the path that I wanted to take um, and literally just be a violinist playing an orchestra. But when I was 11 in seventh grade, I started getting bullied at school and I started writing my feelings down and kind of just started like writing poetry and kind of journal journaling a little bit. And mm -hmm. then because I was always around music, I was told to try and play guitar so I could sing a little bit. And that's kind of how I started doing that. And that's why I started becoming an artist because I never really had a person to talk to. My, my school called it girl drama. So I never really had a person just to like chat with about what was going on. And um, I started just turning to music and I still sing and perform and play music for everybody and put music right. out. If I can make somebody forget about what's going on in their life for two seconds, for three minutes of a song or for two hours of a set, then I've done my job right. 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 Okay. So I've heard you talk about performance yeah, and, and how, you know, this recent episode that we went through, I don't like getting into all that, but, um, the, the absence of your opportunity to perform yes. was kind of a struggle. Now, as a kid, were you also about the performance at that point? Because you said you kind of invested in the songwriting part. Um, when yeah, that corner turned. No, I was yeah. a performer from probably, I mean, it's funny. I, w I had stage fright when I was younger. Yeah. I was at the top of my class in middle school, and I remember not being able to go to the front of the auditorium to like get my awards like at the end of the year because I was too scared wow. to be on stage. To the point now where it's like I love being on stage. My heart is performing. I absolutely love doing it. I want to be a touring artist at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really funny coming from that to where I am now. And then, 
so I would have thought you picked up the guitar and then started songwriting, but you started writing first before you played guitar. Okay. Yeah. Now I was, you're, you're 11, 12, 13 at that point. I was an 11, 12, 13 year old piano player nice. in Texas before MTV. So playing piano was not cool at all. And I took some heat from that. Now I was poking around and I found, um, there's a gentleman named Chuck Baugh. I know it's a surprise that, that, you know, you have the same last name, but, um, uh, I found a performance of yours, <laughs> um, called middle school and, and it's a, appears to be, and you can correct me. It looks like a song that you did around that time where you just kind of said, okay, you're going to bully me for this. I can cave or I can go at it full bore. And yeah. there you are shooting a music video in the school that I'm thinking this is all going on in. So actually seven, six and seventh grade, I had, okay, back up. I had okay. to audition in order to get into this middle school. And so it's very exclusive. It's basically like right. Juilliard for middle school. And okay. so six and seventh grade, that's where I was. When I started speaking up about what was going on and I started yeah. having a voice, um, the school called it girl drama and they weren't doing anything about it. And so right. I was like, well, then I have no reason to be here. That's kind of when I started kind of forming into country music. My dad is from West Texas. So it was either okay. classical music or country music in my family. Um, so I started failing my playing tests on violin because I started adding these little trills and these extra little things at the end of my scale tests. Right. And it literally right. failing me because I wasn't playing exactly what was on the paper. I mean, mm -hmm. the notes were right. Everything was right, except I didn't play exactly what Beethoven wrote 800 years ago. Right. They started failing me. And I think that was the turning point after getting bullied in the school, not doing anything about it. And then me failing for being cre creative. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, then I'll just go to public school. So I did. And that was my eighth grade. And that's when I wrote middle school about how you can overcome anything. And it's going to get easier with time. And I asked my school if I could record a music video at the school. So we literally hung out with all of my friends, a big Costco bucket of candy, and one Friday night of just us recording this song. And it was really, really fun. Um, it's definitely one of those things that are in the vault now. Right. But let's dig it up and let's talk about it. <laughs> well, it's, but what a great thing to have, um, even if it's the way you tell the story to your kids down the road. Absolutely. You know, the way you you confronted that and embraced it. And it says not only a lot about you now, but but a lot a lot about what you were going to do then, because you and I know um, this is not an easy business to be yeah. in. And if we're if we're prepared to confront some challenges, you've got you've got some opportunities. So um, I just I love I loved recognizing that, seeing that I love that you did that. Thank you. I, I won't share it to anybody, but I'm going to go back and look at it some more. I I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I know we're going to do a couple of songs, but I want to, um, do you know what you're going to perform for us today? I would love to perform my single Think About Me, if that's okay. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Um, well, let's talk about that for a minute um, so we can kind of set that up. Now, that's the one you wrote with Barrett, right? Is it? That's the one I wrote with Alejandro Medina. Okay. Okay. So um, walk us through that a little bit, kind of set us up. Um, I guess you're ready to, to perform whenever, um, whenever you kind of set the song up, but kind of tell us, um, tell us kind of how you took what was going on with you at the time yeah. and turned it into that song. So this song is probably one of my favorite songs I've ever written, not because I went through a breakup, but kind of just because I lost myself. So over COVID, um, when touring was taken away from me, it was one of the toughest things I've ever had to do deal with. Yeah. Um, because performing is such like a part, big, huge part of who I am being on stage and, and touring and playing music for people. Um, so when I literally was stuck in my house, I don't think I knew, I really didn't know what to do with myself. And so I put music away for a little bit in order to fall back in love with it. And I listened to a lot of John Mayer, which is really funny. Um, I started listening to a lot of podcasts that he was doing. Um, meanwhile, I still wasn't playing guitar. I still wasn't singing a whole lot. I kind of was just hanging out with the few friends that I was COVID quarantining with. Um, 
I started listening to a podcast where he's talked about where he hated playing singer songwriter rounds. And I could kind of relate to that. I like, I like playing singer songwriter rounds because it's something to do when it's something it's somewhere to perform, mm -hmm. but I also never really related to it because I am such a musician. And there's a lot of people who play them who aren't musicians at heart. And that right. was really hard for me because I'm such a jammer. Like I'll sit there and jam on someone's song and they're like, can you not do that? I was like, Sorry. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So I related sure. to him a lot because he talked about how nobody really used the guitar as an accompaniment instrument. They only used it as literally just a prop to get them through the song. It was never part of the song. And so I was kind of listening to what he was saying. And he was saying that he started writing songs like Neon um, and Why Georgia and um, a few of those other tunes where it's just like those are such intricate guitar parts and those are just such wild like well-known songs where it's just like if those guitar parts weren't there the song wouldn't be what it is like neon right. i don't know if you've ever heard of that it's just really like picky guitar songs awesome mm -hmm. um it's like in a drop c tuning or something it's just really cool but yeah. that wouldn't be what it is if it was just drumming and so i kind of took that to heart and started learning all the way he was picking and kind of learned his songs and fell back in love with just being okay with sitting on my couch and playing music to my goldfish. Right. Um, so I recorded a few songs over COVID with a producer that we just started hanging out and kind of just making music to like 5 a.m. Like literally old school, didn't do it for any reason except because we just needed like a musical therapy moment. So right. we recorded five songs and Think About Me was the only one where after I listened through the entire EP down, I cried. I don't know what it did or why I cried. It was just one of those songs where it hit me and it just made everything I went through over COVID worth it. And right. so I felt like that was the universe telling me that, you know what, like all of it was worth it. Like you got something beautiful out of it. And I put it out after a year after I <laughs> wrote it, I put it out in June, um, June 18th of this year. And we are at 650,000 streams on Spotify and wow. it is my highest stream song to date. And so it's really, really cool, like seeing that story come to life um, and right. being able to finally see it and hear it. Yeah. Well, please let us with let us hear it. Said, Do what? So with that being said. <laughs> yes. With that being said, please, uh, Maggie Ball, take it away. OK, this is my brand new single. Think about me. Feel free to go stream it on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if you still think about me When you find yourself still driving past my street Cause there's a part of me that knows you have A piece of your heart that won't let go But you and I were never meant to be Sometimes I wonder if you have moved on if you wish I was still wrapped up in your arms But I just can't explain that it's okay To be in love with the one kind of way So I don't know what to do Cause there will never be me and you And when you go to the same old bar The one from the night Stole my heart, but you still drink the same old whiskey. And every time you pour yourself a glass, and all the memories you have, but you still think about me. But you still think about me. Yeah, all my friends, they always ask what happened to you. Where the hell you went and who broke up with who? But I just can't explain that it's okay To be in love with the one I got away So I don't know what to do Cause there will never be me and you And when you go to the same old bar The one from the night you stole my heart You still drink the same old whiskey and every time you pour yourself a glass And all the memories you have You still think about me 
And when you go to the same old bar, the one from the night you stole my heart, do you still drink the same old whiskey? Every time you pour yourself a glass, and every memory you have, do you still think about me? And every time you pour yourself that glass, and every memory you have, do you still think about me? The bang to pour is comprised of a sweet corn mash base. The front has a subtle sweetness and not too sharp. It has notes of a medium char or white oak for a smoky flavor in the middle. And the tail has a super smooth and warm finish. Go behind the scenes with some of the biggest artists in music today with the Backstage Pass, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. Join Brandon Morrell and his co-host Hersey Krause and Jeff McMahon as they talk to rising stars and legends about their music careers. Listen to their latest tracks and learn fun facts about the men and women behind the music you love. And be sure to tune in to the Backstage Pass Monday through Friday from 3.30 to 6.30, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. And welcome in to the Backstage Pass... Well done, well done. Thank you, Maggie. Nice. Are you hearing me? Hello. You there? You there? I'm here. Okay. Um, Just making sure I wasn't I wasn't hearing you. Are you hearing me okay? I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Perfect. What did I tell you? Technologically challenged. <laughs> That's hey, I'm I am right there with you. You're you're more on top of it than I am. So well. Okay, so I want to go back to something you were saying before we played. Um, you were talking about how how you uh, how you are a musician first. Yeah. And I wonder kind of um, how that plays out for you in the context of working with your band, um, uh, because uh, as you kind of described, a lot of times. Uh, when you're when you're playing in a writer's night or you're playing in a band, yeah. you're the only guitar player. So you don't have to match perfectly with another guitar player. You're the only bass player. You don't have to match perfectly with that bass player. But when you're playing a violin in an orchestra setting, yeah. it's very specific, very intentional, very, very practiced. Yeah. Now, how does how does that work for you? Does it make you more patient? Does it uh, make you less patient because you are more articulate about that kind of, how does that work, um, for you? And is that an advantage or a frustration? I feel like I've never been asked this question before. This is so cool. Um, I feel like I kind of did the opposite that a lot of violin players do. Um, so my biggest hero is Charlie Daniels. And right. when I was 13, I was able to play with him on stage. Um, I played double went down to Georgia with him literally like two feet away from him. And it was the coolest moment I've ever had. Um, ever since that moment, my, mm -hmm. this is going to sound so bad. My articulation and the way that I do the violin has gone downhill so much. And yeah. I was practicing. I mean, I still practice. Oh my gosh. But when I was practicing every single day, when I went to violin lessons, when I was in orchestra, when I had to learn those like four page long pieces, when mm -hmm. I was playing with other violinists, like you said, it's very practice. Like all of our bow hands are going the same way. When I was doing that, I was so focused on trying to be perfect that after I played with Charlie and I saw where he held his violin, I saw the way his fingers were. I saw the way he held his bow. And I was like, you're like the king of fiddle on country music. And like, you're amazing. And you're not doing anything that I literally was told to do. Like, what is going on? And so I started following him and kind of studying him and seeing what he was doing, um, wow. where I kind of just like lost a little bit of that like old school violin poses, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. instead of being all the way back to the point, like I have TMJ on my left side of my mouth because um, of growing up and having to hold my violin so specifically on my face to the point where like I still have jaw problems today. And so I don't think wow. I've ever told anybody that. <laughs> But, I, but yeah, so it's like because that's real because I was told like very specifically how to hold my violin for so many right. years. 
that when I saw and played with Charlie, all of that went downhill and I started becoming a little bit more creative. So to Mm -hmm. answer your question, I've just decided to kind of do what I want and not necessarily what's right because back then I didn't really want to become well known of what somebody else who was well known and the song that they wrote a long mm-hmm. time ago which is why i'm still like i'm not a fan of playing cover songs because i'm like i they already became famous and like they're famous songs for like them being creative i was like i want to be the same so to answer your question i feel like with my band it gives me a little bit of like i know the back end of music where it's like i learned the theory i can read music i know what it was like being so like articulate and with somebody to the point where i have a little wiggle room because i also enjoy like coming up with parts and people maybe being a little off but it's like we all gave it our creative um thoughts so that is like more important to me than playing exactly what i wrote like two years ago you know what i mean right i'm no, always- totally improving um and improving creatively where it's like okay wait we just played this maybe we could play it a little slower and add a guitar or steel solo in the beginning like i don't ever play anything like exactly the same ever right right well and i know um if you played if you played on stage with charlie um then he was playing right at the same time and you were not playing exactly the same because he doesn't play it exactly the same Uh -uh. or didn't no. Uh, God bless him, you know, never played it the same way twice. And, um, and there was, um, when he did that, I mean, did you even, did you ever rehearse with him or did he just pull you up and trust that it was going to be good? He literally just pulled me up. So the story yeah. with that is, um, it was right before my 13th birthday and okay. I was asked to open up for the event in Weston, Florida. It was a free concert that he was doing. And mm-hmm. he I, he needed like somebody to do the national anthem for the event. And so I don't okay. sing the national anthem, talking about creativeness. I played on violin because there are so many fantastic, amazing singers out there who can do that. And it is such a gift to be able to sing that song. And so I was like, I wanted to be a little different. And so I, start, I started playing it on the violin. And so they thought it would be perfect, this little fiddle player, like with Charlie opening up the vent with the fiddle. So mm-hmm. um, I got there really early and I met him backstage just because I had a meet and greet and he gave me one of his violin bows and we kind of took a picture and that was it and I was sitting in the front row because I got there so early for sound check eating goldfish and his manager walks over to me and was like do you want to play on stage with Charlie Daniels and I was like yes so right before obviously <laughs> Devil Went Down to Georgia is his, is his last song sure so he met me backstage he was like do you know Devil Went Down to Georgia and I honestly my little 12 year old was like no <laughs> I was like I know half of it so if you go back on YouTube and watch the, the video, you'll okay. see ap- actually focusing on his hand. And like, I didn't move the whole time because I was focusing on his fingers and trying to figure out what he was doing. And so right. nobody would have known that if I told the story because it looked like I knew the whole song. But I knew it in my head enough to be maybe be like, sure, 20,000 people don't mess this up. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and uh, and what a great dude. I mean, oh my God. I was He's- around him a couple of times. Yeah. He yeah. is amazing. And I'm just really grateful that I got to play with one of my heroes before. Obviously, God bless his heart. He, he sure, sure, sure. Well, and I would say you you are far ahead of me. I had I had the opportunity to play with one of my piano heroes, but not until I was 39 years old. Um, and I'd been listening to his records for 30 years. I, I did a, a, a thing with uh, Elton John once. Oh, my and, God. And... Um, um, but you are way ahead of me, 22, 23, 21. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so you're, you're running way ahead of me. So good things are coming for you, young lady. You. <laughs> okay. So I want to ask you about another, um, of, of your heroes. And then I want to, I want to get back. I say hero. I don't know if, if this is true or not, but you know, you've had the opportunity to, to, um, experience some really gracious people in this industry. Um, a lot of people know Charlie Daniels and his reputation. A lot of people don't know um, our friend Neil McCoy, who's a big yeah. fan of the show. Um, you know, I've known him since I was playing clubs, you know, back in the day. And you've had some opportunities to to work with Neil McCoy, right? He is amazing as a human, as a performer, and a lot of people don't know, but he is like one of my most 
amazing. He's amazing. I can't even speak. He is one of my like biggest influences when it comes to performing on stage. The way that he is, the way that he has his mannerisms, the way that he's with his band, his set list, just everything down to like when he gets on stage to when he gets off stage. Like I have watched his show so many times where it's like I've gotten people to tell me like Maggie, you're not as cool as Neil McCoy. Like you can't do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm trying to be like him. Like, he is one of, like, my biggest influences when it comes to being a performer. Yeah, he's – uh-oh, you better look out. You got a train coming behind you? <laughs> yeah, there is a train. You need to start start making a train track for us. Folsom Prison Blues or what? What's yeah, going? yeah, yeah, something there. Um, okay, so, Ooh. Neil McCoy, now you've also got – oh, we're fine. You're fine. This is country music. You know, if you can't handle a train go by – I know for you real. Know, you got you got to quit. Um, Neil, of course, is great. Um, you've got a pretty interesting other little project that you just got to contribute to. Uh, it, I mean, I think it just came out here in the last mm -hmm. days, week, right? With Luke Bryan, Trace Atkins, and Pitbull, of all things. I know it has a concert tonight in Nashville. I wish I was going. I wish I was playing fiddle. <laughs> yeah, who's uh, Pitbull's got a concert tonight? Yeah. That would be nice. So, so, um, talk about, you know, I mean, that's so many people see those collaborations kind of happening. I mean, uh, and I know when you're shooting videos, you may not be palling around with everybody, wow. but, um, but still, I mean, you got, you got to be a part of something that a lot of people would envy. So give everybody a little glimpse of, of what that was like. So I was there probably for like 10 hours. We did it at the Luke 32 bridge downtown and we shut down the entire bar. And so it was a lot of extras. There was a uh, Luke and um, Trace were there. Pitbull did his own part in Miami on his yacht, which is cool. It's fine. I guess like the yacht was a lot cooler than <laughs> the bar, which is fine, I guess. But uh, so they were there. And so they stayed upstairs for like a little bit, but they came down and like hung out with us and, I was there for like 10 hours. It was so much fun. Like I've never seen a full production um, director, director team, like production managers, like production teams. Like I've never seen like a full length music video like that before. And it was really cool just to be a part of it and kind of just like be on the outside a little bit instead of it being mine. And then like not really knowing what to do. And like, it, it was cool being on the outside. And so um, I was really grateful that I got to be um, the featured violin player instead of just there to dance and be an extra. Like I feel very humbled and grateful to be there as the violinist. Um, and so it was really, really fun just being able to hang out with everybody. And I'm so upset. I have this one clip that me and Luke did together where we're standing right next to each other on the mm -hmm. stage and it wasn't added in the music video, but oh, I have a clip no. of it on my phone and that, means more to me than the world seeing it. The fact that I had it and Luke and I had this moment, that's all that matters. <laughs> well, you know, that will be the thing. If you just slip it to me down the road, whenever you do Jimmy Fallon the first time, yeah, I'll send it. You can pretend like it's a surprise and we'll have him put it on TV. I oh, so Maggie, I just, yeah. Yep. So I'll hook you up. Ooh, we'll get it done. We'll get it done. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is, you know, Jimmy Fallon. No, but you know, they don't know. I'm on the it's microphone. Just, it, people never. believe it, <laughs> but they always, you know, you always find those things that surface out of nowhere. And this is, we'll just make I'm sure it surfaces. A, a, a gold mine. So maybe I could like sell it to TMZ down the road or something. That's right. That's right. We will, it will surface when it needs to surface. There you go. Well, I know you're going to play another song for us. What, um, what else are you going to play for us today? So I could play my new single, Drinking to the Broken Hearts. Please. And this is the one, this is the one that you wrote with Barrett, right? Yes. Which is, uh, of course, Barrett Baver. A lot of people would know him um, from The Voice. So again, you're, you're getting to work with some pretty talented folks, um, learning a lot. Um, kind of set the song up for us and then we'll let us hear it. So Drinking to the Broken Hearts, I wrote back in 2019 with Barrett, and he is such an amazing human. And I remember sitting in my room trying to come up with song ideas, literally just old school sitting, playing a guitar and just seeing what sticks. Um, and I came up with the line, tonight we're drinking, we're drinking to the broken hearts. And something about that just stood out to me and was like, 
this song will have a lot more life to it if I bring it to somebody who is of age Mm -hmm. who can help me write it. And I've always wanted to write a song from both the female and male perspective about the experience after a breakup. Sorry, there's a bug. (laughs) About the experience after a breakup. And Barrett and I just wrote it that day. And I've been holding on to it from releasing it for about three years now or two years now. And I'm very glad that I did because I think it is a great song to follow up, um, Think About Me. I'm really grateful that I did because I'm showcasing more of a vulnerable singer-songwriter side of me that mm-hmm. I've never showcased before. So I'm really grateful that I held on to it. And so I'm really excited for the world to hear this one. You can go great. stream it now on Spotify. Yes, absolutely. I have and will. Um, so please, Maggie Ball. When you're on your way home, do you still drive by? Do you miss that touch in the middle of the night? Is the one you lost still all you see? Every time you dream, yeah, but then you're just like me. So here's to all the boys at the bar alone, pouring on whiskey to try to get it gone. Shot after shot, glass after glass, when a bit me pops up, there's another one back. This one's for the girls on the bathroom floor, wishing that he'd walk back through that door. All cried out, hearing a mess, phone on the right and a bottle on the left. Raise one up, we left to our pots, and I went. Drinking, drinking to the broken heart. Does it hurt like hell when you hear that song? How much can you say? Yeah, I'm for you, turn it off. You might be fooling everybody, saying you're alright. Yeah, I'm then you're just like me. Boy, you got a heart like mine. So here's to all the boys at the bar alone, pouring on whiskey to try to get it gone. Shot after shot, glass after glass, when a berry pops up, there's another one back. This one's for the girls on the bathroom floor, wishing that he'd walk back through that door. All cried out, hearing a mess, phone on the right and a bottle on the left. Raise one up for what love to a pot. So now we're drinking, drinking to the broken heart. Bartender, break out that bottle and fit them on us. For all the folks out there that ain't been lucky in love. So here's to all the boys at the bar alone. Pouring on whiskey to try to get it gone. Shot after shot, glass after glass. When a berry pops up, there's another one back. This one's for the girls on the bathroom floor. Wishing that he'd walk back through that door. All cried out, hearing a mess. Phone on the right and a bottle on the left. Raise one up, but love torn apart. I'm raising a toast to a brand new start. Tonight we're drinking. Yeah, tonight we're drinking, drinking to the broken hearts. The bangtail pour is comprised of a sweet corn mash base. The front has a subtle sweetness and not too sharp. It has notes of a medium char or white oak for a smoky flavor in the middle. And the tail has a super smooth and warm finish. Go behind the scenes with some of the biggest artists in music today with the Backstage Pass, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. Join Brandon Morrill and his co-host Kirsty Krause, Jeff McMahon, and Karen Lee Batten as they talk to rising stars and legends about their music careers. Listen to their latest tracks and learn fun facts about the men and women behind the music you love. And be sure to tune in to the Backstage Pass Monday through Friday from 3.30 to 6.30, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. And welcome in to the Backstage Pass... Well, thank you thank so you. much for that. I, um, I mean, I, I feel sure. I mean, a lot of what you were explaining about that song, glad that you hung on to it. But not only is it timely, but as opposed to what you might have been able to do a year ago, 
speaking to the vulnerable part of that, you can now more readily perform it yeah. and share it, which we would not have been able to do, nope. you know, this time last year. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I had um, a couple other questions before we wind up. And again, <laughs> thank you so much for carving some time out for us. Um, of my super busy schedule. <laughs> hey, hey, we've all got things. I don't know. You might have to go fix your car or something. Heck, I don't know what you're doing. But we've, we're we all trying to make things happen. Um, but I wanted to ask you, in the, in the context of that performance, um, a lot of people do this already because they're trying to create content. And that's fine. But as I listen to your acoustic performances, um, it feels like, again, that's a pretty intentional choice that you're doing those for a specific reason. Um, talk about that because um, it's hard, you know, as much work as goes into these records, it's hard not to prefer, particularly with that song, yeah. uh, the acoustic version that you've also shared. So I am such a bubbly human. Like this personality is who I am on stage. I am a firecracker. I run around. I do not sit still for more than two seconds. Like this is bothering me that I'm sitting still. Uh, <laughs> I am like this all the time. And so that's how people know me because I'm such a fiddle player and I'm such a musician and I'm a performer. I run around on stage. And so people know me as being just such a bubbly human. And so I've never showcased... I've never put out a slow song. I've never showcased my vocals in a mm -hmm. way where it's just me and a guitar. And so I thought over COVID because all I had was me and my guitar. I wanted to kind of showcase what I did and kind of what I found and this new version of who I am coming out this year. And so think about me was intentional. I put out a debut slow song on purpose is because I was so certain that everyone would want me to put out a fast song. So I did the opposite of what they wanted me to do because that's something I've never showcased before. And so I thought, think about me deserve to have a life of what it sounded like in COVID with me and my guitar. And so it meant a lot to me to be able to showcase not only a, a vulnerable song being slow, but also the vulnerable side of me where everything shows. It's just vocals and it's just a guitar. And that's what I've never showcased before. And so putting out another slow song was exactly intentional because I've never done it before. Yeah. Yeah. So it's well, all purposeful content. I, no, I, I'm i saying I knew it was purposeful. I just wanted to know what your purpose was. <laughs> I knew it was on purpose. It was purposely purposeful. That's well that good, good that you found your special purpose. Um, so, um, one last question, um, as a career side man, okay. Play always playing piano for other people doing those other things. Um, collaboration is key, you know, knowing how to work within a group and a lot of artists don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, you know, because they, they wrote the song, but they haven't developed as a musician the way you have. They haven't worked in a group or in an orchestra line or in a choir or some of those things. So um, recognize that you, that you have that advantage. What suggestion would you offer or what do you think you understand that makes you uh, a better collaborator working within a group the way you will be for a long time? I really enjoy being a backup musician just as much as I do being the front man. Um, I, over COVID, I did honestly consider wanting to go on tour with a major artist um, just so I could have that experience under my belt, just so I could get back on the road because I missed it so much. Um, and I was totally fine with just being a backup musician. Um, I've gotten hired a lot being just a fiddle player or a utility player um, because I play so many other instruments. Um, and it's been a really fun, it's a, it's a very good learning experience because it teaches you how to be part of the team. It teaches you what it's like being a side man for somebody. And it, it, it shows you how artists treat their band. And so right. it's kind of like my band or my brothers, like I do not see myself like higher up than them. Like we are all equal. Like I will not have a show if I do not have my band or my production crew or whoever else is on my team. Like I know, like, I can't just do that all by myself. And so being a backup player really just humbles you and it gives you this experience of what it's like 
for your crew. And over, like I said, over COVID, I was really considering just being a backup musician just so I could literally just get my feet wet and get back on the road. And then right. things about me started taking off a little bit. And I was like, you know what? Like I am an entertainer at heart. Like even when I'm backing up someone else, like I can't sit still. And that's, I guess, when I realized that I do have that quality of being the entertainer and, and the front person, but I also can like play backup for somebody too. And I think it's really awesome having both um, aspects and, and seeing an eye on both things. Yeah. Yeah. You were talking about John Mayer and, you know, he does a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember seeing him on the Tonight Show one night. I think he was on there with T-Bone Burnett and uh, he was in the back playing guitar. Nobody announced him. He wasn't featured. He wasn't. Yeah. Um, and then you kind of saw Jay Leno at the end of the show. You kind of heard him just for a minute. Kind of, oh, hey, John. Hey, John. You know, not for the cameras, not for anybody else, but he was just back there playing his role. And uh, yeah, I think you're, I think you, it's, uh, you learn a lot more about, about the structure when you play both roles. So, so Plus, that's great. It- if you're a musician at heart and you just love music, mm-hmm. like that showcases a lot more where it's like, obviously he wasn't the featured artist, but he just like loves playing and probably loves that artist. So right, it's literally all about the music at the end of the day. Well, you're making some great music, ma'am. Thanks. <laughs> so we appreciate you coming and sharing it with us uh, and all of our folks. Um, tell everybody how to keep up with you uh, the best way so they know what's coming. Well, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm very active on there. You can follow me on Facebook. Please go stream both of my new singles that you heard today on Spotify as well as Apple Music, Pandora, um, Amazon Music, wherever you listen to music and follow me and let's be friends. Definitely follow her. Yes. <laughs> follow follow her. Yes. Follow yeah. Me. They will. They will. And you're in Nashville, so I will be keeping my eyes out. So I hope I can... we can do something together. Like let's write a piano song or something. We, well, you're much more the writer than I am, but I know a guy that can play. I, there it is right there. Me too. So, <laughs> so we'll do it. Thank you so much for making time for Thank us. You for having Everybody me. follow Maggie Ball and we will see you next time here on the Backstage Pass with Brandon and Kirsty and Karen and Nick and maybe even me. So we will see you next time. Thank you again, Maggie. And Absolutely. we are out. Thanks.